Coffee can help you lose weight even if you don't exercise. The beneficial antioxidant called chlorogenic acid will be erased if you don't watch out. Hi friends! Did you know that your morning cup of joe has the potential to burn fat? So let's talk about how you can maximize coffee's secret benefit for weight loss, reduce liver inflammation, and increase longevity if you drink the right coffee in the right way. Now, in this cup is the world's most legitimate, widely consumed, psychoactive, natural pesticide, caffeine. Now, what kind of coffee do you drink? Caffeinated or decaf? For over a century, it's been known that caffeine boosts metabolism, causing a thermogenic effect. Unlike tea, one cup of coffee has 100 milligrams of caffeine, which is also a weight loss drug and performance enhancer. So if you're looking for something to motivate you to exercise, then you may want to consider timing your cup of coffee before you exercise. Caffeine simply makes exercise more enjoyable. Even athletes perform so much better that the NCAA has a limit on caffeine and they will literally test their players with a urinary caffeine test. Runners just run faster, cyclists pedal harder, and weightlifters could squat 600 pounds more weight if they drank coffee. Now, of course, if you exercise more, you will burn more calories and increase your muscle mass to reduce blood sugar spikes, beneficial for weight loss. But coffee can help you lose weight even if you don't exercise. In fact, it's a fallacy to believe that you have to exercise to lose weight. Exercise, of course, is always better for health when you do it properly. But you can lose plenty of weight without exercising. With just two cups of coffee a day, you can increase your metabolic rate by 10%. Now, remember how I said coffee has a thermogenic effect? Well, you can measure that as irradiated heat from your skin because your body temperature will rise by half a degree. Now, lots of people don't think that their thermometers are accurate because their body temperature keeps changing. But your body temperature does change because it's regulated by various factors, including hormones, as well as your circadian rhythm. And this will change over a 24-hour period. Your body temperature is generally lower in the morning, and this is partially due to lower levels of cortisol and other metabolic hormones during sleep. But as your cortisol rises, your body temperature will also increase. I'm sure you've heard of cortisol, it's the stress hormone. It's the hormone produced by the adrenal glands, and it naturally follows a diurnal pattern peaking at around 8 a.m. And in the early afternoon, your body temperature starts to rise as cortisol levels increases. Body temperature tends to be at its highest in the late afternoon to early evening due to increased physical activity as well as metabolism. Now, as your melatonin levels go up, then your temperatures go down. So melatonin is produced by your pineal gland and that helps to regulate your sleep as well as it promotes a decrease in body temperature after 9 p.m. Now don't forget your thyroid is also important in temperature regulation and if you have an excessive amount of thyroid that can increase your body temperature and low thyroid hormone will do the opposite, decrease your body temperature. And for women during their menstrual cycles, they will have a fluctuation in their estrogen and progesterone levels, and that can also affect their body temperature. Now, when you get a good night's sleep, growth hormone will be secreted, which can also increase your body temperature. So now you know that your food, like coffee, can also affect your body temperature. Now, every cup of coffee can help you burn an extra 17 calories, which is really negligible if you're drinking this kind of coffee. These kind of coffee blends easily exceed over a thousand calories. It's like dessert in a giant cup. But if you drank your coffee black, you would be in a net calorie deficit as a cup of black coffee has just two calories. And this is why it's okay to drink plain black coffee when you're fasting as it won't break your fast. So how do you drink coffee? Black? Or are you like a third of America who enjoys coffee with cream and or sugar? Now, if you put dairy in this cup of coffee, then the beneficial antioxidant called chlorogenic acid will be erased because the casein protein, it binds to the chlorogenic acid, inhibiting your body from absorbing it. Now, people who drink coffee throughout the day, they can actually burn an extra 100 calories, but it doesn't just help burn calories. It also suppresses your appetite by inducing a hormone called peptide YY. And that hormone makes you feel full and satiated. And this is why coffee is 
often the preferred liquid during fasting. Now, when you're not fasting, coffee could potentially reduce your overall calorie intake by 55 calories a day. Now, which on the surface isn't a big deal, but you can imagine that 55 calories can add up to 550 calories in 10 days and 5,500 calories in 100 days, which is not bad for a cup of coffee. Now, drinking two cups of dark roasted coffee could potentially reduce your weight by six pounds in about a month. I'm not sure why, but it didn't happen when people drank medium roasted coffees. Now, drinking less than four cups a day can lower a person's risk of asthma. Now, many asthmatics find relief when they drink some coffee. And this makes sense as caffeine is known to open up airways. Theophylline is a prescription drug that's actually a caffeine derivative, which has been used to help manage asthma. But don't confuse the root cause or triggers of asthma with the medications or foods used to relieve it. It is always best to identify the root cause of asthma because prevention works so much better. But let's face it, you're probably drinking coffee for its psychoactive stimulant effect, which is from the caffeine. But once you drink coffee for its stimulant, you could spiral into a dependence on caffeine if you don't watch out because it does change your brain chemistry and can reduce your quality and duration of sleep. And this can make you gain weight. Now, people who don't sleep well, they simply gain weight. Sleep deprivation induces more ghrelin. It's the hormone that stimulates your appetite. Now, leptin, the hormone that signals satiety, also decreases with the lack of sleep. And cortisol, the stress hormone, also increases from the lack of sleep, which further increases your appetite and promotes fat storage, particularly around the abdomen. I know when I don't sleep well, I look for junk food. Sleep-deprived individuals often consume more calories, especially from high-fat, high-carbohydrate foods due to increased hunger and cravings. Now, if you're trying to fight insulin resistance, then skipping sleep can lead to more insulin resistance, making it harder for the body to process glucose efficiently, which leads to weight gain, and it increases the risk of type 2 diabetes. And of course, this all negates the thermogenic effects of the caffeine in the coffee. Now, on top of that, sleep deprivation can reduce your body's ability to burn calories at rest. It lowers the resting metabolic rate, opposite of what drinking caffeinated coffee does. And in addition, when you're tired from the lack of sleep, you simply will be less active. I literally walk about 4,000 less steps when I'm sleep deprived. So if you're a regular coffee drinker, it's important to understand how coffee can interrupt your sleep, which is due to the caffeine. So if you drink decaf coffee, then it shouldn't have this effect. The caffeine in coffee is a stimulant because it blocks adenosine receptors in your brain. Now, adenosine is a neurotransmitter that promotes sleep and relaxation. So when it's blocked, it prevents the onset of sleepiness and therefore increases alertness and reduces fatigue. In other words, caffeine inhibits your body's ability to relax, which is a problem if you have anxiety or sleep issues. But when caffeine wears off, the adenosine can do its job and bind to receptors to then make you sleepy and relaxed. But usually people try to counteract that. So then you need to drink more coffee. But the body is still trying to relax. So it will make more receptors looking for that adenosine. So over time, you're just going to need more and more cups of coffee to have the same effect on your alertness. Do you see how this can quickly just spiral into a dependence on caffeine? Now, this is why it's best to wait at least an hour or more after waking up before drinking any kind of caffeine so that your body naturally clears the adenosine. Otherwise, the adenosine lingers and when the coffee or caffeine wears off, then you're going to get really tired and find yourself in an endless cycle of needing more coffee to stay awake. Now, I'm sure you know caffeine negatively impacts sleep. Sleep to your body is more important than food, even though your brain may do things to chase food and try to avoid sleep. Now, if you've ever fasted for 24 hours, you know it's pretty unpleasant but you're able to do it and you're still able to function. Now, if you have ever stayed up for 24 hours, you know you are barely able to keep your eyes open and you feel terrible, fatigued, and with brain fog. At that point, driving is super dangerous and working is very inefficient and you're prone to make mistakes. The longest time I stayed up was 
for 36 hours straight working as a intern, basically a physician in training during my internal medicine residency. That morning, there were three critically ill patients who had back to back to back heart attacks. And I was the only one carrying the cold blue pager. Needless to say, my brain was fried that day. I didn't live far from the hospital. And when I got home, I basically cried for half an hour and then I fell asleep until the next morning when I had to get myself up and go back to work. Now, you may be surprised to hear that despite my stressful, hectic work schedule, I never drank coffee throughout college, medical school, or my years as an intern, resident, or fellow after medical school. And that's because I was really afraid this cup of coffee would interfere with my sleep, which I struggle to get enough of. Consuming coffee, especially close to bedtime, can can delay your onset of sleep. This means it'll take longer to fall asleep and caffeine can also shorten your sleep duration, leading to overall less sleep. It can also disrupt the normal sleep cycle, particularly reducing the amount of deep sleep, the slow wave sleep and REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, which are crucial for restorative sleep and cognitive function. And this is why it's not good to use caffeine to wake up. Now, of course, caffeine affects everybody differently differently. And that depends if you're a slow or fast metabolizer. Now, for most people, caffeine has a half-life of about three to five hours in their system. This means that half of the caffeine consumed remains in the body for that duration of time. So it can take over 10 hours to clear that caffeine in the body from your morning cup of coffee. I know I'm really sensitive to caffeine that even tea, which has a third of the caffeine in a cup of coffee, can keep me awake all night long if I don't time it right. So if you consume multiple cups of coffee throughout the day, the caffeine can accumulate, making it harder to fall asleep at night. And if you metabolize caffeine more slowly, just one cup can disturb your sleep over 12 hours later. So how do you know if you're a fast or slow metabolizer? Well, you can test yourself with just drinking a cup of coffee to see what happens, or you can get your genes tested. The gene that influences the rate at which caffeine is metabolized in the body is the CYP1 1A2. This gene encodes for an enzyme called cytochrome P450 1A2, which is primarily responsible for the metabolism of caffeine in the liver. But this enzyme also metabolizes over-the-counter drugs as well as prescription drugs. Now here's a list of them. It is really important to let your doctor know if you are drinking caffeine and taking one of these prescription drugs. Now sometimes the reaction can be prolonged caffeine levels, sometimes it's prolonged drug levels, and other times it's reduce drug levels. And if you have a variant of the gene, then you are a fast metabolizer and will metabolize caffeine so much quicker. Now, these people can consume caffeine without the prolonged lingering effects on the body. I probably have another variant, the slow metabolizer, in which I metabolize caffeine more slowly and caffeine just stays in my system longer, potentially leading to more pronounced disturbances in my sleep. I've never been officially tested. I just noticed that if I drink tea past noon, I'll be counting sheep all night and still be unable to fall asleep, whereas I usually fall asleep within five minutes anywhere. Caffeine is not just in coffee. Here's a list of caffeinated beverages because it acts as a pesticide to ward off insects. Now, if you watch my other videos, you know that I used to love eating chocolate. When my son was two years old, he ate some of my dark chocolate thins when I was away at work. He literally finished the whole box, which didn't seem like it was very much because they were so thin. But boy, that kid was wired running back and forth in his bedroom all night long until until 3 a.m. And for a while, I stopped buying chocolate and kept all the chocolate away from my kids. Now, I don't really buy chocolate due to the heavy metal contamination, but I buy unsweetened cocoa powder and make my own sugar-free chocolate. And I don't know why the unsweetened cocoa powder isn't as popular to my kids, but I certainly enjoy making homemade chocolate and I included that recipe in the email. Now, it's generally recommended to avoid caffeine intake at least six hours before bedtime to minimize its impact on sleep. And for someone like me, that's actually more like 12 hours. Even drinking two cups of coffee at 7 a.m. can actually change your brain EEG, the electric waves that we can measure later that same light, causing more shallow sleep and delaying sleep by 10 minutes. And to me, this is a big deal. I time my sleep to the T because I struggle to make time to sleep due to my busy life. 
Now, besides being a slow metabolizer, if you have glaucoma, which means elevated eye pressures, you should really consider drinking only decaf as caffeine will increase your eye pressure. Caffeine acts as a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, which leads to an increase in intracellular cyclic adenosine monophosphate dehydrogenase, thereby stimulating the production of aqueous humor or more eye fluid that increases eye pressure. And unfortunately, half the people with glaucoma, they don't even know they have it. And over time, they can slowly lose their vision. If you remove the caffeine, would coffee still be beneficial to drink? Absolutely. But that benefit depends on how you drink it and how long it's been roasted. Coffee has polyphenols and chlorogenic acid, which are believed to have anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial properties. Now, these compounds can inhibit the growth of harmful bacteria and support the growth of beneficial bacteria. Now, the darker the roast, the less beneficial polyphenols the cup of coffee will have. Now, do you know any popular dark roasted coffee coffee? company. This paper measured the chlorogenic acid level of coffee from Starbucks. Not much. Surprisingly, coffee is also a major source of dietary fiber because Americans barely eat any fiber. There's only two grams of fiber per cup of coffee. And it may seem tiny, but the average American only eats 15 grams of fiber throughout the entire day, which is really, really poor. However, if you drink coffee, you still may have a beneficial gut microbe called Lawsinobacter and Bifidobacterium, a group of beneficial bacteria associated with improved digestion and improved immune function. And together, the fiber and the polyphenols in coffee act as prebiotics, substances that feed beneficial gut bacteria. Now, the fermentation of these compounds by the gut bacteria can lead to production of short-chain fatty acids, such as butyrate, which have an anti-inflammatory effect and supports your gut as well as your overall health. And it's also been shown that those who regularly consume coffee have a greater microbial diversity in the gut, which is a marker of a healthy microbiome. Higher diversity is linked to better overall health and resilience against diseases. Now, we are all surrounded by toxins, especially liver toxins, from alcohol to cigarettes to viruses. People exposed to alcohol and cigarettes and hepatitis C virus appear to have a benefit from drinking coffee. Alcoholics who drink two cups of coffee daily can reduce the risk of liver cancer by 50%. And if you smoke, drinking twice as much coffee or four cups a day can reduce your risk of liver cancer too. Coffee appears to be beneficial to those who have hepatitis C as well. However, in reality, coffee is just not enough to reverse the damage from alcohol, cigarettes, or chronic viral infections. So ideally, the greatest benefit is to avoid exposure to these toxins. But if, however, you have hepatitis C, please see your medical doctor, as now we have effective therapies that can eradicate and cure hepatitis C. Now, have you heard of hemochromatosis? It is a genetic disorder characterized by excessive absorption and storage of dietary iron, leading to iron overload in various organs, especially the liver. Now, hemochromatosis is one of the most common genetic disorders in the United States, and an estimated 1 in 200 people of Northern European descent have it. And approximately 1 in 10 individuals are carriers of one of the gene mutations. Early symptoms, they're really nonspecific. However, advanced hemochromatosis can cause liver failure and diabetes. Avoiding iron and limiting dietary iron is really important. And that is where coffee can be helpful. If you drink coffee with your meals, coffee can reduce the absorption of iron from your food by 39%. And this effect can last even an hour after eating. So if you don't want to reduce your iron, it's it's best to drink coffee an hour before eating food. Now, if you drink the wrong kind of coffee, you can increase your cholesterol by 10% because coffee contains fats called cafestol and colweol. Now, the best way to avoid elevated cholesterol from coffee is to make sure that all the coffee you drink is filtered through paper. Just by paper filtering your coffee, you can eliminate 95% of the cafestol. Now, lighter and medium roasted coffees have twice as much cholesterol raising fats compared to dark roasted beans, but they also have more chlorogenic acid. Now, personally, I would want to drink a light roast and filter that through a paper. Non-paper filtered coffees like boiled or French press or Turkish coffees and even espresso can actually elevate your cholesterol. Percolated and instant coffees, they both have pretty low effects on cholesterol, even without the paper filters. However, even paper filtered high cafe coffee can significantly increase your cholesterol if you've already have 
high cholesterol. So if you have high cholesterol, try to drink low cafetal coffees, which will be darker roasted coffees. Make sure it's coarsely ground and always drink it through a paper filter. And if that doesn't work, consider drinking less coffee and giving up coffee altogether and drink tea. When it comes to longevity, coffee appears to be a longevity drink, probably because it's a bean. It appears to be protective against the development of fatty liver as caffeine is a potent autophagy stimulant, but even decaf coffee stimulated autophagy. And autophagy is really important for those with chronic liver disease. Coffee actually contains more than a thousand compounds, including chlorogenic acid, which is shown to also enhance autophagy in cultured human cells. Now, the last time I did a coffee video, people commented that coffee has tons of pesticides and fungicides. So I looked into that. So yes, many beans have been sprayed with pesticides, but the pesticides are actually worse for the local farmers. And there doesn't appear to be much pesticide for people who drink it. Now, roasted coffee can contain some pesticide residue, but the levels are generally low and considered safe for consumption. So here's some key points to remember when it comes to pesticide. The roasting process reduces the amount of pesticide residues, partially because the high temperatures during roasting can cause breakdown of many pesticide compounds, decreasing their presence in the final product, which is just simply the liquid. But of course, if you want to learn more about coffee, watch the next video.